speaker today is, is speaking for the second time before the City Club. She was here in 1984. The subject does not change radically because the subject has not gone away. It was with great fanfare that America began to fight a war in the mid-60s. The war was not fought on any foreign soils and it was not run by the Defense Department. This war was the war on poverty. And for some cynics among us, they believe the poor have won. Why has America been unable to eliminate or at least substantially reduce poverty amongst our own citizens? Some say it is a welfare system that institutionalizes poverty and leads to a never-ending road of one generation after another being locked in a poverty cycle. Our speaker today disputes that charge. And in fact, she contends that with adequate social politics, if we would adopt those and define them amongst the government and amongst the marketplace and with the American family, that in fact, we might have some progress in the war on poverty. Francis Fox Piven is a distinguished professor of political science at the Graduate School and University Center of the City University of New York. She earned a PhD in social sciences from the University of Chicago and has taught at Columbia University and Boston University as well as the City University of New York. A prolific author, she has recently co-authored books including The Mean Season, The Attack on the Welfare State, and recently Why Americans Don't Vote. Would you join with me in welcoming in a speech entitled The Institutionalization of Poverty creating an underclass in America. Help me welcome Francis Fox Piven. I've been asked to talk about the institutionalization of poverty in the United States, about what some academics are coming to call the growth of an underclass, and the role of welfare programs in creating that underclass and in perpetuating that underclass. Let me begin with some facts. Poverty is increasing in the United States. In the past decade, the numbers of people who fall below the official poverty line, $11,600 for a family of four per year, the numbers of people who have less income than that has risen by 28%. It's now at 33 million people uh, at the peak of an economic boom. That is the numbers of people who are officially poor. More broadly, talking about the people who are not well off, the bottom 20% of our population has also lost income in the last decade. Their income is down by 10%. Poverty is increasing not only among the people who sort of fill our image of the classical poor, the derelict and the shiftless and so forth. Poverty is increasing most rapidly among working people. Poverty has increased in the last decade by 43% among, among full-time workers. Poverty is increasing very rapidly among children, especially young children. 20% of the kids under six now live in families that are poor. And again, it's important to remember all this is occurring in the sixth year of an economic boom. It's not just statistics either. 
The evidence of poverty in the United States has become very palpable. We see it when we walk through our city streets. We see it in the huddled bodies of the homeless. We see it in the public places that have become encampments, refuges for people who have nowhere else to go. We see it in the numbers of people who ask for a handout as we walk through the streets. And we see it in other symptoms, too, in other kinds of pathologies that are escalating that we usually associate with poverty. Infant mortality is on the rise, particularly among minorities in the United States. Experts tell us that children in our country are getting sicker, have more chronic illnesses. We know that the rate of ed educational failure in our country, not only of school dropouts, but of children who go through school and don't know how to read, the rate of educational failures is escalating. Drug addiction is spreading. So is crime, but it's not just crime. It is the pathetic, bizarre kinds of crimes, sickening crimes of the desperate. I have a friend who is a judge in the criminal court in New York City who calls me from time to time when the day has been almost too much for her to tell me of cases that she's tried, uh, people hauled in for sucking tokens out of the turnstiles in the New York subway system, or of people brought in for stealing one shirt from a department store. These are the crimes of the desperate. These are the crimes of 19th century London, the crimes of the people who stole six teaspoons and were sent to the gallows. The cities, and our cities are becoming like 19th century London. The squalor, remember the gin, the dirt of 19th century London, the untended babies. It was also the depiction of Shanghai in the 1920s. Well, how do we explain how we have come to this kind of pass? Observers, social commentators, all very wise men, in 19th century London, uh, attributed the squalor and the desperation and the gin drinking that surrounded them to a kind of natural law of market societies, a natural law through which the fittest were selected, those who were the most capable and the most industrious were selected, and a natural law which also led to the inevitable destruction by disease or death of those who couldn't hold their own in the marketplace. That was how it was explained in the 19th century. But since that time, and especially in the United States, there has been the spread of very different ideas, of democratic ideas, of ideas about some kind of fundamental equality amongst people, an idea, and there's also been the spread of prosperity. This kind of, these, this dual change, the spread of a kind of democratic sentiment and the increase in prosperity has made 19th century interpretations untenable. We don't believe anymore that poor people are another kind of creature in God's world. We believe that they are fundamentally human beings like ourselves. We believe in a fundamental equality. We also have ideas about the responsibilities of our government for sustaining an even, stable economy and for doing something about the casualties of our economy. We have ideas about government responsibility for community well-being. Moreover, we have an electoral system, S an electoral system which makes political leaders to some degree accountable for answering to the standards of our community. People vote. And that means that the growing poverty and growing pathology and squalor in our communities demands explanation. That means that poverty is a political problem. And it has to be rationalized, especially it has to be rationalized in the context of increasing affluence. This poverty is occurring while some people are getting much richer. 
while the top 20%, for example, of the population has realized an increase in income in the last 10 years of 16%, the top 5% an increase in income of about 25%, the top 1% an increase in income of about 50%. And this is to say nothing of the sometimes scandalous methods by which that increase in income has been realized, as when the p poor residual programs in housing that were left for the poor were plundered by the people who attacked them. Well, we've had explanations of why poverty is increasing, why pathology is increasing, why our cities are becoming like 19th century London or like Shanghai in the 1920s. One of the main explanations is that welfare itself, the kinds of programs that we have supported because we thought they did something about poverty, that these programs in fact cause poverty. Now the argument that's made is actually rather familiar to those of you who know something about 19th century disputes about poverty and poor relief and charity. In the 19th century, there were frequently cautionary diatribes, arguments against the giving of charity to the poor because that would, in, in the end, increase their slothfulness and increase their poverty. It doesn't matter that studies, even at the time, and certainly subsequent studies, demonstrated very clearly that in the 19th century, even a full-time factory worker could not afford the minimum requirements of subsistence. And despite the fact that we now know that the charity that was given, which was said to increase laziness and so forth, was itself pitiful, baskets of coal and so forth. Well, nevertheless, this kind of cautionary history is not enough. We still have to pay attention to this argument that welfare causes poverty, that trying to help the poor in fact has perverse effects because it has become very influential. And the main way, the main illustration that's used to validate this argument is the AFDC program. I want to take a few minutes to talk about that program. The program Aid to Families of Dependent Children. It's a program that spends $8.3 billion uh, of our federal budget. It reaches 3.7 million adults, only a third of the poor, by the way. And it's good to remember how comparatively little it spends, how few people get AFDC. It's good to remember that in the context of our current plans to spend $100 billion minimum to bail out the SNLs. It's good to remember that this program, which has received so much hostile propaganda, it only costs eight, $8 billion of the federal budget. Well, how, does, how is it said to cause poverty? There are two main ways. First, we are told that welfare payments constitute a disincentive to work. The average family on welfare gets $4,200 a year. This is supposed to be a disincentive to work. The second argument is that the availability of welfare of $4,200 a year for a family on average is also an incentive to socially irresponsible behavior, to making illegitimate babies, to spouses leaving each other, to raising children in a kind of slothful dependence on welfare and causing a new kind of social pathology that is now called intergenerational poverty. Now, this argument has in its favor a kind of, I suppose, poetic appeal. Uh, you know, we're kind of attracted by ironies. Here we tried to do good by giving something to poor mothers and their children, and it had a perverse effect. That's a sort of argument that kind of has a certain attractiveness. It also has the attractiveness of relieving us of any responsibility, of relieving us of any guilt that we might feel for the fact that only a third of the poor get any of these payments and that what they get is only $4,200 a year for a family. That is to say, 
It relieves us of any responsibility for worrying about the fact that we're condemning small children to malnutrition, to a sense of alienation and marginalization. We don't have to worry about that because it would have an ironic and perverse effect anyway. They would be even poorer as a result of getting these payments. But the argument really makes no sense. We shouldn't allow ourselves to be soothed so easily by poetic ironies and so on. Just think about it. If it were true that giving people payments, income, giving poor people this kind of income help, in fact encouraged the behaviors which perpetuated poverty and increased poverty, because poverty is increasing, if that were true, then countries which provided liberal payments for those in need, for those who are unemployed or those who had income below a certain level, those for women raising poor children, raising children in poverty, programs that had countries that provided better programs, that had child support payments, and more liberal unemployment insurance programs, and so on, these countries would have more poverty, and they would have more squalor, and they would have more homelessness, and they would have more illegitimacy. That would mean that when you visited Amsterdam or Stockholm, you would see in the public places of these cities the huddled bodies of the homeless, and the beggars asking for a coin. But of course you don't. In countries that have decent social welfare programs, poverty has not been increasing. And you don't have the palpable evidence of pathology that you have now in our communities. The places where you see the kind of observable poverty and wretchedness that you see now in American cities are in third world cities where there are no government programs to aid the poor because these countries are so poor. The other way in which it really makes no sense, this argument that the right has really mounted against social welfare programs to excuse poverty by saying social welfare programs have caused it, the other way in which it makes no sense is that these social welfare programs have been chipped away at steadily in the last 15 years. AFDC payments are down by a third since 1973. Even taking food stamps into account, the income of these families is down by 20% since 1973. Well, if the argument were correct, this steady decline in income supports through the means-tested programs would mean a steady reduction in poverty. And of course, the effect has been just the reverse. While these programs have been cut and poverty has increased, as common sense rather than right-wing sense would lead one to expect. Moreover, if this evidence is not persuasive enough for you, there is the additional evidence of literally hundreds of studies which have searched for a correlation between the receipt of welfare, work effort, illegitimacy rates, family breakdown rates, intergenerational dependency without success. The Congressional Budget Office itself reported after reviewing hundreds and hundreds of these studies that these theories have simply not been confirmed. Well, If we were to insist that somehow the fault lay with what we were trying to do to help the poor, there is another argument that has emerged, particularly in the past few years, to account for poverty in the United States. It's an argument that has been nurtured by liberal foundations and by some academics, and you've heard it. The argument, the insignia of the argument is the word underclass. The argument goes like this. Poverty in the United States, the worst poverty, the persistent poverty, the patholo pathological poverty, the disgusting poverty, results because some people default on their social obligations. They drop out of school. They don't want to work. 
they won't maintain their families. Something about those people leads them to default on their social obligations. Now, of course, there is some sense in which this is true. It's true, at least, that there is an association between poverty and other social problems. Poor kids are more likely to drop out of school. Poor families are breaking up, so are a good many affluent families, of course. But the fact that there is an association between poverty and social problems doesn't prove by any means that there is some cultural phenomenon, some attitudinal development among the poor which is causing both the social problems and the poverty. I think that the association results because hopeless people and the United States people who are poor, remain poor for a long time, and see no way out are hopeless, hopeless people do seek what kind of satis whatever satisfaction they can get. That's true. Children who are brought up in an environment of hopelessness who see their mothers and their fathers and other adults in their community as despised creatures, despised by the rest of the society, these children are not going to go to school and learn very easily. They don't think that there is a future for themselves. Remember London in the 19th century and the social commentators who said there was something about these people that accounted for their poverty, that accounted for why they spawned illegitimate children, for why they drank gin, and so forth and so on. Those are our ancestors, right? Well, this underclass argument is different from what I'm saying. It's different from the argument that persistent hopelessness does lead people to default on their social obligations. This underclass argument says, rather, that there's something about these people, not their circumstances, but something about these people, something about their culture, their attitudes, which leads them to default on their social obligations. Moreover, whatever that thing is that there is about these people, tends to spread. There's a kind of disease or epidemiological model that's being used now in the academy where these indicators of pathology are plotted on maps to show that there is a kind of contiguity between uh, various measures of social problems. Of course, what is also correlated if you plot it on a map is objective poverty, material poverty. And it's correlated with school dropout rates, with unemployment rates, with crime rates, and drug use, and so forth, and so on. The other thing that is so tragic about the rise of the culture of poverty argument is that it offers no reasonable solution. It suggests no way out. It takes the burden of responsibility away from us, away from the larger society, away from those of us who are better off and says, that with really, there is nothing that you can do about these people because you can't, we don't know how to change people's heads, short, of course, of mass incarceration. Well, taken together, this welfare causes poverty argument and this underclass argument, even if we aren't entirely persuaded by these arguments, do distract us. They turn us away from the structural changes in American society, which do indeed cause poverty, which do indeed cause objective material poverty, and over time also cause the pathologies which follow in the wake of long-term poverty in an affluent society. Moreover, these arguments not only turn us away from the uh, structural changes which cause poverty, but they turn us away from changes about which we might be able to do something. Once we shake our heads clear a little bit, I think some causes of poverty, structural causes of poverty, become obvious. 
Let me name some of them. I think you will agree, or some of you will agree. One change that is very, very important and that accounts for poverty and long-term poverty is the change that has taken place in the labor market. It's true that there have been a lot of new jobs created in the last 10 years in the United States. However, 40% of those new jobs pay less than poverty wages for a family of four. Moreover, in 1987, the average hourly earnings of all non-supervisory workers, not just workers in new jobs, had fallen to a level lower than they had been in 1966. It's also true that we have witnessed in the last decade or so the proliferation of new kinds of jobs which are sometimes called contingent jobs. Lots of people work at temporary jobs, part-time work, homework. We had eight million of those jobs in our economy in 1980. We have 18 million of those jobs in 1988, most of them filled by women and by minorities, by the way. In 1984, young men entering the labor market for the first time earned one-third less than they had earned these comparable young men entering the labor market for the first time in 1974. If they were black young men, they earned 50% less than young black men had earned in 1974. Meanwhile, another structural change has unfolded. The programs which were inaugurated in the 1960s, some 25 years ago, the anniversary that we're now celebrating, the programs that were inaugurated or expanded to shield people from these exigencies have been steadily assaulted over the last decade and whittled away. The unemployment insurance program inaugurated not in the 1960s but in the 1930s now reaches a smaller proportion of the unemployed than it has at any point in its history since the time it was created in 1935. Only 30% of the unemployed are now covered by unemployment insurance. Welfare, the welfare program has, as I said already, been cut. The food stamp program has been cut. The Medicaid program has been cut. Think about it. The numbers of children who live in poverty has increased by a third in the last five years. Meanwhile, the numbers of children who are covered by Medicaid has been cut by 400,000. Now, these structural changes, changes in the labor market and changes in the programs are not the whole of it. It is more complicated. As I indicated before, it's not just economic circumstances, but it also, poverty also has to do with the internal capacities of communities and of people. We are frequently led to consider, for example, the comparison between the experience of the contemporary poor and the immigrant experience, the experience of some of our grandparents and great-grandparents. That comparison has often led us to be intolerant of the contemporary poor, partly because on the one side we have a fairy tale image of what the immigrant history was, what it was like for the Italians and the Slavs and the Jews and the Irish who came over a hundred years ago. We forget about the slums of our cities and the rampant crime and the pathology and so forth and so on. And we forget how many generations that persisted. We tell a cleaned up version of the immigrant history in which they worked hard, got ahead, and next year their children were in college. Didn't happen that way. It was a bitter, brutal, and terrible history. And a lot of people did not make it. They're not here to tell their side of the story. So on the one side, we tell a fanciful history of the immigrants. On the other side, we don't take sufficient account of the exceptionally disruptive, disorganizing experiences of many of the contemporary poor, especially the minority poor. 
Look, for example, at the fabled history of the immigrants and the role that neighborhood stability played in that history. When we learn about the immigrants, we learn, for example, that they had a dense associational life in their communities, associations for everything, burial associations, kinship associations, this kind of association, that kind of association, all sorts of self-help uh, networks through which they were able to weather, or some of them were able to weather, hard times, sickness, unemployment, and through which their eventual upward mobility was facilitated. There's some truth in this story. The self-organization of immigrant communities was very important in their survival and in their ultimate success. But think about what is what we have done to the communities, to the territorial communities of the contemporary poor. Their neighborhood basis for self-organization, self-help, has been repeatedly, again and again, destroyed, first by urban renewal, through which people were uprooted, the common places in which they lived together wiped out, then by the practice of rampant milking by slum landlords, of low rental tenements so that many of them stood empty and abandoned and became havens for drug addicts, and then by the current spread of gentrification through which people are again displaced. Under those circumstances, it's difficult to see how poor people could, in a sense, bind themselves together and try to weather economic exigency. Well, what then should be done? What then should people like us, groups like us, who are better off and who are in a position to see beyond immediate hardship? What should we do? I think ultimately what we need to search for in this country is a set of arrangements through which economic decisions, investment decisions, are made not only with a view toward profitability, but also include social criteria. We need to begin to think of ways to do that, as has been done in other Western countries so that in economic decisions are made not only according to how much profit can be made, but also according to how many jobs will be created, who will get the jobs, what sorts of wages are paid, what are the polluting effects of that kind of investment, what are the effects on community, under the, on, what are the effects on the enormous cultural investment that communities make as they persist over the years and human networks are developed, what are a range of effects that are in the end just as important as the bottom line. That's what we ultimately have to search for. But meanwhile, in the shorter run, it is absolutely urgent that we begin to argue for programmatic initiatives that repair the damage that has been done in the last 15 years, the damage to public programs, that repair the damage that has been done to our educational system so that we turn out generations of children that are only quasi-literate, that repair the damage that has been done to the health of Americans, especially poor Americans, especially poor children who are going to be with us for a very long time, that we repair the damage that has been done to our housing with the result that we have stopped building housing for low-income people in the United States, that we repair the damage that has been done to our income support programs like AFDC or unemployment insurance, which after all is the bigger worry that welfare, that $4,200 a year for a family, causes shiftlessness, which I doubt, 
or is it a more serious worry that to fail to provide a minimum income, a minimum sustenance to the families, to the mothers who are raising the children who will be a large proportion of our future population to fail to provide for these families is to invite future social conflict and disorganization on a scale that is unimaginable. Finally, I don't think there are any quick fixes. I think much of the damage has already been done and cannot easily be undone. I'm not confident that mothers on crack can be easily regenerated. Maybe they are lost. But what about the mothers who are not yet on crack? And what about the children of those mothers who have not yet become drug runners? To do less than to try to reach these people, to try to, ma to make it possible for them not only to survive, but to become part of our society. To do less than that is not only to continue the politics of greed that has dominated the last decade, but it is to engage in a set of policies that is short-sighted, anarchic, and ultimately will hurt us as well. Because in the end, we are one nation, and we will all bear the cost of these policies. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for uh, an inspiring address. We now move to the question part of our program, and the first question is the privilege of our board host, Alan Oliver. There are a lot of issues that I'm interested in asking you about, but I guess I'll ask a philosophical or sort of a speculative question. Um, when I hear you speak about the kind of society that we're creating, it sounds to me like the kind of vision that Huxley had in Brave New World where there are stratifications in the society of the alphas, betas, and gammas and that you know each one doesn't want to be like the other. Um, how accurately do you think that uh, that vision reflects what we're seeing now? Um, or do you think uh, in the next 25 years we'll be seeing something uh, different or closer along those lines? Well, I think that uh, your analogy resonates. There is a very significant sense in which we're becoming a much more sharply stratified society, a significant sense in which we're allowing a generation of poor children to be raised who are going to look different than affluent children. We're going to return to the early 19th century when the poor were stunted, shorter, deformed, often crippled. Uh, we are now beginning to see a generation of children who uh, are raised without health care, with inadequate nutrition, uh, babies born to addicted mothers, and so forth and so on. It's quite a frightening image on the one hand. On the other hand, I don't think that the politics that has dominated the last 10 years is going to last. I don't think that uh, Americans, poor Americans, and there are many allies because there are a majority of Americans don't approve of these policies that have been causing all of this damage. I don't think they're going to allow it to continue. I expect a kind of uh, political renaissance, a kind of uh, restoration of the political ferment and the moral indignation that dominated politics in the 1960s when we made a good deal of progress in expanding and improving our social programs. Uh, uh, Fred Haler, member. What is your view of the legislation being uh, uh, pushed by Senator, Senator Monaghan in the next few years? Well, the, if you mean the Family Support Act, right. uh, it is legislation. 
it has been passed. Not funded, but passed. Uh, that legislation is two-sided. Some of you will be familiar with it. It has really two faces, a kind of two-edged sword. On the one hand, it presumably makes available to uh, mothers uh, who are on welfare, it makes available to them some subsidies for childcare, some funds for education and training. However, those funds have not yet been uh, authorized or appropriated. On the other hand, however, and this is the worrisome part of the legislation, I'm in favor of expanding opportunities for poor women. Uh, I think a lot of them do want, we know that from uh, the Massachusetts ET Choices Program, a lot of them do want and will take advantage of training uh, programs, job search programs, and so forth, and of course, child care subsidies. On the other hand, what's wrong with the program is that it makes participation in these programs compulsory for most mothers on AFDC, including, by the way, mothers of uh, infants, without a f I, I'm against any kind of compulsory work requirement, by the way. I don't think it's necessary, and I think it's dangerous in welfare systems because poor people in welfare systems are typically unable to guarantee their own rights. I mean, it's a very unequal bureaucratic relationship that takes place between the people who work for the uh, agency that's implementing these new regulations and the supplicant, the poor women, w woman with the children and so forth. So I'm against any kind of, for a number of reasons, I'm against any kind of compulsory work fair, work participation requirement. I don't think we need it. I think the fact that we have it is dangerous. It's especially dangerous because the child care and the training funds are so minimal and the federal guidelines uh, the federal oversight provisions on state and counties, states and counties which will be implementing these programs are very inadequate. We already know from the experimental workfare programs in the states, in New York State, for example, a liberal state, uh, that in the experimental workfare program, most of the money that was saved through workfare was saved by terminating women who had not complied with one or another of the elaborate regulations that was associated with the new workfare program. They came in late, well maybe the kid had a, no matter. They were cut off welfare as a result of that. The state saved money. After all, it took a long time before these women got back on welfare and they saved much more money than they saved as a result of the employment of these women. Finally, we know from 38 states that had experimental workfare programs that the successes, the successes, earned on average $4.04 an hour. Now, women who earn $4.04 an hour cannot earn enough to take care of the children, much less to pay for child care, and the federal child care subsidies are temporary. So you can be absolutely sure that what we are creating is a kind of revolving door, a pathetic, sickening revolving door in which we engage women, involve them in training programs, send them out into the marketplace, only to have them have to return to the welfare system again because you can't pay for child care on a minimum wage or a near minimum wage, and we're not providing long-term child care. Uh, Helen Lee, a member of the club. This club is engaged right now in a multi-phase study of racial justice in the Portland area. Uh, I'm involved with a committee that is looking at uh, welfare and health care issues. Could you address uh, racial inequality or inequality of uh, opportunity in the welfare system? Racial inequality in the welfare system. I think racial inequality is a problem not of the welfare system, it's a problem of our society. Uh, and it is a pervasive problem in our society. It penetrates not only our economy, our labor market, but it also penetrates our politics. Uh, th it, the result of that is that minorities are disproportionately represented in the welfare system. They are disproportionately the recipients of welfare because they're poorer than other people in our society. And they are also disproportionately the employees of the welfare system because 
uh, their occupational opportunities were opened more quickly in the public sector than they were opened in the private sector. Now, one consequence of that development, that minorities are heavily represented on AFDC, both as workers and as recipients, is that that program has been more vulnerable to public attack because everybody understands it really as a program for blacks and Hispanics. So that to attack AFDC has become in our society virtually a euphemism for an attack on black people and Hispanic people. It's one of the reasons that that program has been held up again and again by conservative analysts as the example par excellence of a program which creates poverty and pathology. It's because the program is already associated in American minds with black people and Hispanic people. So racism has been part of the attack on the welfare state. Uh, your remarks uh, got me to thinking about the choices that we each face uh, in the public uh, area aside from electing this representative or that representative. In the next month, our county faces a $40 million levy for a jail. How would you advise us to think about voting yes or no on $40 million for a new local jail? I'm sure this exists elsewhere around the country. Yeah, it certainly, it certainly does. It's a very diff it is actually a difficult question. It's difficult because by voting no on the levy, it doesn't mean that you thereby ensure that uh, young people charged with crimes get various kinds of therapeutic interventions and so forth and so on. What you ensure is that existing jails are overcrowded. That's what you ensure. Nevertheless, uh, I would be inclined to vote no. But I'm not denying that it is a difficult question. Gene DeMaster, City Club member. Can you talk a little bit more about the hope? Can you go into a little bit more about what trends and kind of movements in the country do you see as the most, po the most positive for overcoming homelessness or poverty or lack of education? I think ultimately, Overcoming homelessness, poverty, lack of education is going to depend on the political mobilization of the people who suffer from those problems. It has always been that way in the past. Our significant reforms, our significant reforms that redressed poverty, that expanded education, that did something about bad housing or bad health in the United States were the reforms inaugurated in the 1930s when there was a movement of industrial workers and a movement of the old and a movement of the unemployed, or the reforms of the 1960s, which were very much a response to the black movement. I think ultimately important action in the area of social welfare, public programs, depends upon the mobilization and the empowerment of poor people. But I also think that in the United States, the political power of poor and working people has been greatly reduced over the course of the 20th century by their systematic disenfranchisement. Now, that will amaze you. You will think I am a nut, a conspiracy theorist. This is the most democratic country in the world. Is it not? And the answer is not. It is not. We live in a country in which only half of the electorate votes for our president. Turnout is higher in presidential elections, and only half turn out. Now, in all other Western democracies, Turnout ranges around 80% in important elections. We also live in a country in which those who vote are much more likely to better be better off and better educated and somewhat more likely to be white than those who don't vote. Moreover, I don't think that that is an accident. I think that that has to do with the fact that we're also the only country in the West that has a 
system of personal voter registration, a system for making up the list of accredited voters, which depends upon potential voters themselves taking the initiative and figuring out how to get on the list. And everywhere in the country, since this system was introduced around the turn of the century, it has been implemented in such a way so that the administrative procedure creates ad hoc property and literacy tests. So the people who are less educated, less confident, who have to work longer hours, are less likely to find their way to the Board of Elections. That's more true in some states than in other states, but it is basically true everywhere in this country. And since that, since that system was implemented, voter turnout has steadily gone down. It's gone down especially among low-income people and less educated people. So that the second part of my answer is, I don't think that we are going to have a fully humane and decent set of public programs until democratic rights, the right to vote, is, are extended to all of the citizens of the United States, including the least well off. Dave Olson, member of the club. The stealth bomber has given us a number that uh, is rather awesome, $500 million. If you had $500 million to spend to clothe and house and feed people, how would you spend it? Well, $500 million in a country as big as ours and as rich as ours is not really so very much money. Uh, you said the stealth bomber. I prefer the SNLs example. Uh, <laughs> after all, that's between 100 billion and 300 billion. Uh, I'll take only, say, half of the 100 billion, and I would create first a decent income maintenance system that made it possible for poor families, especially poor women raising children, to live at least at the poverty level. That also provided uh, all working women with childcare. That expanded educational and job training opportunities. That guaranteed to the unemployed for a reasonable interval of time uh, income support until they could find another job. I would create a national health system. I need to go into the other, begin to go into the other half of the $50 billion that's left now to create the national health system. I want to create a national health system so that, what is it, 37 percent of Americans don't have health insurance. I want all Americans to have access to health care, especially the low-income Americans, uh, the low-income women who now don't get prenatal care, uh, who give birth to underweight babies, babies who start out behind the eight ball. So I have, I need more than $500 million. I do, I'm sorry, I do need more than $500 million. But with $100 billion that we just gave away to the SNLs, minimum that we just gave away to the SNLs, we could really make our country a much more decent place. Last question. Uh, you talked a lot about the needs for education, and it, it seems like today that there's a lot of educational inequity in our country. If you live in a certain area, you're out of luck. If you're under the poverty level, you're out of luck, et cetera. What kind of public policy on a national level, because I, I think asking the states to raise the money is kind of unrealistic, what kind of policy on a national level do you think is realistic now to make our educational system somewhat equitable and give ourselves a future? Well, we need to spend a lot more money on our educational system, although I would agree with the critics who would say that just throwing money at problems uh, doesn't necessarily solve them. But we do have experience of uh, methods of edu educational methods that have shown substantial successes. For example, we note the Head Start program works, that it really does help poor children. Why are we so crazy, so short-sighted, that we have not expanded that program so that all poor children are in the Head Start program, for example? I'll give you another example. About, what was it, six years ago or seven years ago, 
a businessman in New York named Eugene Lang uh, told an East Harlem sixth grade class that he would guarantee to every child in that class that he would pay for their college education if they made it to college. Moreover, in the interim, he would provide them with counselors and tutors. He, as sort of an act of charity, and I don't like the idea that this should be done, you know, one man doing it for one group of children, but he did change the horizons of those children. He changed their long-term outlook. He told them that you're not doomed to repeat the lives of the adults in your community. You can get out. And then he provided them with some of the supports that might make it possible for them to get out. Half of those children are in college. Half of those children are in college today. Again, I don't want rich people to go around adopting class. I want, as a matter of public policy, for us to say to poor children, A, we're going to give you resources to help you make it through, even though in a lot of ways the odds are against you. You can have counseling. You can have part-time jobs. You can have tutors. And if you make it through, you can go to college. And if you make it through college, you can get jobs on the same terms that white men can get jobs. If we were to do that, I think our educational system would have to be transformed to communicate that message. But you can't just change an educational system. If you just change the educational system, then the children in that system still get their education from the larger world. They don't just listen to the teacher, although they do listen to the teacher, but they also keep their eyes open. They watch the TVs. They pay attention to the streets. And if they know that they belong to a group that has been doomed by American society, they're not going to do their homework or listen to the teacher. Why should they? So you have to change not only the schools, you have to change the schools, but you can't just put the burden on the schools. You also have to change the opportunities, the prospects of poor people in American society. Thank you very much. of the City Club and those present and those on radio, thank you for an inspirational address. Join us next week at the Intermediate Theater of the Performing Arts Center for our Surgeon General C. Everett Koop. We'll see you then. <laughs>